It's my pleasure to introduce to you Carolyn Ivey. She's the director of the Sleep Center at North Florida Regional. Um, she has agreed to come and talk with us today. I'm so pleased that she's here. We don't have a microphone today, and she has a really soft voice, so I need everybody to listen up, okay? All right, thank you so much. Thank you, Rob. Thank you for having me today. It's a pleasure to be here. Can everybody hear me in the back of the room? Just let me know if you can. I'll try to punch up the volume a little bit. Everybody have a good night's sleep last night? Yes. No, I got a few no's in here. Okay. We're going to talk today about sleep and health. Because the quantity and the quality of your sleep affects nearly every body system. With particular impact on your heart, blood pressure, and your risk for stroke. So we'll go over some of those things in a few minutes. But there's a lot of attention in the media about sleep, sleep deprivation lately. And actually 20% of Americans get less than six hours sleep a night. And 10% of us have a significant sleep disorder that impacts our sleep. So what happens when we don't get enough sleep? Well. Obviously, we have difficulty concentrating and focusing. We have memory lapses. I may have a few of those today. We have loss of energy, fatigue, and then there's emotional instability, depression, anxiety disorders, and excessive design sleepiness. And as you can see from the picture, this gentleman behind the wheel who's dozing, how many people are in this room? About 50 people? Something like that, 50 people in this room? Well, the statistics show that two people in this room will have fallen asleep while driving in the past 30 days. That's pretty significant. Absolutely. So what effect does sleep deprivation have on the body? Well, high blood pressure, that's one of the uh, effects, heart disease has an impact on diabetes and control of your blood sugar, stroke, weight gain, and all of these things take some time to develop. But accidents, as we noted from being asleep on the wheel, they can happen immediately. And it's important to do what we can to take care of our health and our sleep to um, avoid maintenance problems that we see in that picture. So why are we sleep deprived? Well, for one thing now, we have this 24-7 lifestyle. People are addicted to 24-hour news channels, and what about social media? You have to find out what's going on on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram, Pinterest. I'm sure I left off about 30 of those. And um, that's a problem. Environment, noise, you may live in a noisy building or have um, noisy roommates, noisy family members, also noise from television. Some people leave televisions on, have a lot of things going, cell phones ringing, telephones ringing in the middle of the night. All those things can impact our sleep. And then light. And um, light is an important factor because light tells us we should be awake. So it can impact our nighttime sleep. And it's not only the night light that we turn on in the house, it's light from the outside environment, from the moon, as well as our cell phones, our laptops that might be near us, our e-books, wireless cards, the, uh, the window on your treadmill that probably shouldn't be lit up at night. All those things can say, hey, maybe you should be awake instead of uh, asleep. And then importantly, sleep disorders. Sleep disorders can cause serious sleep deprivation. And we'll, um, we'll talk about some of those. There are actually over 100 sleep disorders. Today we'll just touch on some of the more common ones. Uh, insomnia, sleep apnea, restless legs, parasomnias, and narcolepsy. Narcolepsy only occurs about one in two, every one in 2,000 people, but it's an interesting disorder. Talk about insomnia first because it is the most common sleep disorder. It's 
not one that we treat very often or see very often in the sleep disorders center, but it is a disorder that impacts quite a few people. Anybody in this room ever have trouble getting to sleep or maintaining your sleep? We all do at one point or another. Sometimes it's just transient. For most of us, it's transient. It lasts maybe a week. And then whatever was causing our stress or causing our insomnia is gone and we're fine. For others, it's a chronic problem and it leaves them chronically sleep deprived. And um, here are some of the things that can cause us to not sleep well at night. And alcohol is one. And we typically think of alcohol as being a sedative. Well, it will put you to sleep initially, but the sleep that ensues can be very fragmented, can be disruptive, uh, wake up frequently. So alcohol is not a good chemical to take to uh, fall asleep. Depression and anxiety can both create insomnia. Stress. I mean, we're living in stressful times, more and more stressors every day. Caffeine, nicotine, those are both stimulants, and taken in late at night can disrupt our sleep or cause us to have difficulty getting to sleep. Late night exercise, go back to that treadmill that shouldn't be in your bedroom. You may think that exercise would make you sleepy and sleep well, but when done late at night, those endorphins, brain chemicals start flowing, and those are those happy chemicals that tell us we're elated and should be doing something other than sleeping. So late night exercise, exercise during the day, fantastic. It's wonderful for sleep. But maybe not an hour before you go to bed. And of course, heavy meals, they just make you uncomfortable. So they should be avoided late at night. And then again, there are the sleep disorders. Obstructive sleep apnea and restless leg syndrome are two that we see most often in the sleep disorder center that um, cause people to have difficulty falling asleep or difficulty maintaining sleep. How do you overcome insomnia? Well, be aware of your habits, the food you consume and the time you consume it, drinks, alcohol, caffeine, some medications, can affect insomnia, and then the time that you exercise. Turn off electronic devices, turn off those cell phones and laptops and computers and televisions. Let yourself get a nice restful sleep and make a cozy sleeping environment. I can't tell you what type of pillow or what type of mattress you should have, whatever is comfortable for you. And of course, we talked about medication. Medication. We really don't like to see people be on medication to help them sleep long term, but it can be very successful short term while you're working through the issues that are causing you not to be able to fall asleep. And cognitive behavioral therapy, that's a non-medication approach that addresses why you're having difficulty, what kind of stressors there are in your life and how you can um, adjust and, and react to them. And then, of course, treatment for sleep disorders. And I believe last year someone came in to speak about sleep apnea. Were any of you at that particular meeting? So we'll go over that briefly. Um, apnea means uh, without breath. So you have disrupted breathing at night. Um, it's as prevalent in middle-aged uh, adults as athletes. So it is a common disorder. It impacts all age groups. Um, I can tell you we've had triathletes in our sleep lab in their 19, 19 and 20 year old uh, uh, athletes in excellent physical condition who have sleep apnea, <coughs> severe sleep apnea. And most people with obstructive sleep apnea are still undiagnosed in 95% uh, of all people with, uh, with sleep apnea have not been diagnosed and are not treated. So let me see if I can get this pointer to work. 
So in this slide, you have normal breathing, and this is an open airway. Just to orient you the tongue here, this is an open airway. In sleep apnea, when you fall asleep, the muscles in your throat and the tissues collapse. And they basically shut this airway down. So where you have an open air airway here, once you fall asleep, those tissues collapse and no air can get through. And you struggle and struggle to breathe. And then your body says, hey, I'm not breathing here. Something needs to be done. And it sends some stress hormones into your system and you wake up very briefly. You may not even perceive that you that you um, were aroused. And then you have a big snore or a snore, blow that airway open, take a couple of breaths, and then sometimes it starts over again. And for some folks, this happens 60, 70, 80 times per hour, per hour. So um, it's a serious disorder. <coughs> Signs and symptoms, we mentioned insomnia can be a sign of it. More often, you have excessive daytime sleepiness just can't concentrate, want to fall asleep, as if you're in a fog or seeing the world through a curtain. Snoring, something else that's common to a common symptom, although not as common in women as men. Men seem to have the record for snoring, but women with sleep apnea often don't snore, but it's still a serious problem. Pauses in breath at night and then waking up, choking or gasping. Additional signs, morning headaches. Remember when you're not breathing, your oxygen level can drop down. You can have morning headaches, depression, memory loss. Find yourself making more trips to the bathroom than you should. And also sexual dysfunction is a, um, an additional uh, symptom of sleep apnea. So how's it diagnosed and treated? Well, go to your primary care physician explain your symptoms, tell them you think you have this problem. They'll do an exam, they may do a questionnaire, and then uh, the only way to really find out is to have a sleep study done, either in the sleep disorder center, in the facility, or we have home sleep testing units now that we can send, home, send, send you home with. They're only good to identify sleep apnea. They can't tell you about other disorders. But for sleep apnea, for someone who's sleepy, who's snoring, who's uh, not getting good nights of it, maybe it may be a good test for them. So if you come into the sleep laboratory, we're going to study a lot of things. One brainwave activity, we're going to look at the stages of sleep. There are four stages of sleep. There used to be five. They condensed them into four. You've got um, stage one sleep, which is drowsy sleep. You're still kind of aware of the environment if something happens, but you're drifting off to sleep. Stage two sleep is light sleep. That's where we spend most of our night. Stage three is very deep sleep. That's where our body is restored, um, birth hormone is secreted, your immune system builds itself. And then there's dream sleep. And dream sleep is very different. Dream or rapid eye movement or REM sleep. What happens during dream sleep? Well, your eyes dart back and forth for one. You can see that on the recordings. But your body's also paralyzed. Your voluntary muscles do not move during dream sleep. And you have some mentations, thoughts, or dreams going on. So there's a reason that our body's paralyzed. We don't want to get up and act out those dreams. And we'll talk about what happens when, uh, when there's a problem with that system. So how is sleep apnea treated? Well, this blockage is kept open by a gentle flow of air. And the machines today are quite small. There's even a newer version of this one. It um, sits right on your bed stand. And the masks that are used are actually quite small also. I can pass this around so you can take a look at it. Just please don't put it up to your nose, but pass that around. So this is the 
most effective treatment for sleep apnea. But there are other treatments as well. Surgery, when I first started studying sleep medicine back about 30 years ago, out in California, and I worked with two of the surgeons who actually developed some of the techniques for removing this crowded airway and opening it up. They had about a 65% success rate 30 something years ago. Today, it's still a 65% success rate. So, this, if used, the success rate is 79, uh, 90s, probably about 95%. So, surgery is not the most effective treatment. There are oral appliances. They may work for very mild sleep apnea, but it don't work as well for severe sleep apnea. Consequences of leaving it untreated? Well, we talked about accidents, falling asleep at the wheel, um, having an accident in a workplace with uh, heavy machinery, um, performance deficits, losing your job, um, and just your quality of life isn't what it should be. Long term, high blood pressure, heart disease, heart arrhythmias. We see a lot of patients come into our sleep disorder center with atrial fibrillation and have uh, obstructive sleep apnea that's untreated. Type 2 diabetes and stroke. So again, you can't tell who, ha who has obstructive sleep apnea. I can't look in this room and say, you must have it, you must have it. I'll probably be wrong part of the time because a lot of it has to do with our physical makeup, our genetics, and some of it with, um, with just the, uh, the crowd in front of it. So that was obstructive sleep apnea, very common. We probably, I would say, 85% of the patients that come to our sleep disorder center come for obstructive sleep apnea. But there's another very common sleep disorder that involves kicking the legs at night. Anybody ever had trouble with creepy crawly feelings in their legs or just can't keep your legs still? Fairly common, restless leg syndrome. Uncomfortable sensations, you just have to move, you can't get to sleep, you feel like you need to be up walking. We've had patients who put stationary bicycles in their room so they can move their legs at night. And um, uh, definitely decreases the quality of your sleep and the quality. There's some day-to-day -day, uh, uh, variability. You can go into remission with this um, leg kicking for a long time and then all of a sudden it starts up again. There's a genetic component. <coughs> About 15% of the cases are a result of lack of iron, but don't just run out and take iron supplements. You really need to see your doctor about that because it may be that your body just can't efficiently process it. But that is a, a cause in about 15%. And then the, the brain chemicals. There's a disruption in dopamine pathways in the brain. So the medicines we give for restless leg, many of them are to restore some of those pathways. Related conditions, we see this condition more often in patients with kidney failure, with diabetes, with neuropathy, lack of sensation, sometimes from diabetes, pregnancy. Um, many people have it when they have it during pregnancy and then many times it'll, it'll be gone. Uh, and then medications can also have an effect on that. And the medication triggers that you have to watch out for if you have restless legs are anti-nausea, antidepressants, antipsychotics, some cold medications, and some heart medications, calcium channel blockers, such as Norvas. Other triggers, there's alcohol, caffeine, and tobacco. Again, it's kind of a theme with sleep disorders. And of course, sleep deprivation. Treatment, lifestyle changes, and medications. Parasomnia is a very interesting group of disorders. These are things that happen during the night that shouldn't. Um, they disrupt sleep. They can cause exhaustion. 
and there are events that you just don't want to have going on when you should be in bed asleep. And they include sleepwalking, night terrors, nightmares, bed wetting, and teeth grinding. Now these are things we typically associate with children. It's not uncommon for children to sleepwalk or to have cry out in the night or to have sleep terrors and bed wetting and the tooth grinding. But it can occur in the adult population as well. Um, again, the risk, children, genetic history or family history, stress, post-traumatic stress, and we also see it quite frequently in patients who have um, issues with alcohol or drug abuse. Narcolepsy. Another very interesting sleep disorder. Again, only one in about 2,000 people have narcolepsy. And what happens is a person will fall asleep at an inappropriate time. Other symptoms, cataplexy, hypnagogic hallucinations, and sleep paralysis. Cataplexy is when you just suddenly lose muscle tone. Hypnagogic hallucinations, you have mentations or dreamlike sensations and then sleep paralysis, you just can't move. Remember we talked about rapid eye movement sleep and you had um, pretty much all those things, lack of muscle tone and dreams, and what happens in narcolepsy is that that dream sleep invades your wake time. And we've had, this, this disorder has been described since the 1800s. But just in the late 1900s, around 1998, 1999, they found a brain chemical that may be responsible for all of this going on. Anybody heard those commercials on television about a certain sleeping aid? And it talks about orexin, that this sleep aid turns off orexin. Orexin is the brain chemical, and you need that to stay awake, and they found out in these patients with narcolepsy. The cells that generate that have degenerated and they're not producing. And that's good news because now they're coming out with medications, basal sprays, and uh, treatments before we have only really stimulants. And um, that's a gentleman who actually has narcolepsy. He doesn't have cataplexy or he would have fallen into that pond that he's fishing in. But he did fall asleep inappropriately. We're going to talk about one of the other very interesting <coughs> disorders, rapid eye movement disorder. Most of the people with this disorder are men over 50. It's very common in patients with Parkinson's disease. And you have to be careful if you have this disorder to avoid injury. So what is it? Well, during your dream sleep, your muscles are not paralyzed. So you can move about and try to enact your dreams. I had a patient who had been a football player, and he, we, he came to the sleep disorder center because of the visit to the emergency room because he had gotten up in the middle of the night, tucked his football in, and ran his head right into the wall in his bedroom. Thankfully, he wasn't severely injured, but um, uh, it probably was severely, <laughs> severely injured, and there are medications for that. So that's what happens when your dream sleep does not go according to plan and you do have muscle activity. And what we see, usually in the sleep disorder center, we'll see people that are eating in bed, some people cycling with their legs in bed, and you know, doing other activities. So, um, and this is just a shot of our one of our sleep disorder center rooms. So sleep disorder testing is pretty easy. You come in, you spend the night, or you take a piece of equipment home and do it in the home environment. Uh, that's a shot of our building, and we certainly hope that all of you, if you have any problems sleeping, will have them addressed and get back to sleeping like a baby. So I'd be happy to take any questions. <laughs>